what's good gentlemen to my review for this week's episode Jojo's Adventure Golden Wind bro bro yo this episode was crazy bro Bruno and the boss damn that man does not fuck around and it's then what was it called uh, King Crimson or something I believe, which I think is actually the original standing, so I think that by, I don't know, I, I'm pretty sure that's actually the original standing too, so I don't think Vince changed that one. If they did, tell me in the comments, because I'm pretty sure that's the original standing name, or at least it was something similar. But bruh, this episode was crazy, man. This episode was fucking crazy, man. Like, uh, it was crazy. Yeah, Bruno's backstory, yeah, everything with the boss, Trish, bruh. Absolutely bad shit to say, boys. Also, also, it's actually currently 11.40 when I'm recording this video. Also, I'm feeling a lot better than I was last week. So, yeah. Finally, whatever the hell is in my system, I have purged it from it. But I actually meant to start recording my review a little bit early. But I found out early in the morning. I was watching JD's off the script this week. And I found out that actually WWE is actually offering a bunch of shit off the network for free. Completely for free. Every WrestleMania, SummerSlam, Royal Rumble, so, uh, um, SummerSlam, I didn't mix that, WrestleMania, the whole, the big four, along with all the takeovers and a bunch of their docs, along with, it looks like almost every WWE pay-per-view, because I checked, all the, the Extermination Chambers you can watch, the, all the Unforgivens you can watch, you can watch all the fucking, um, uh, Over the Limits, because I was seeing if they got some of my, if I could watch some of my old pay-per-views from what I remember when I was a kid, and yeah, man, so, your boy is gonna be busy for the next week. I'm just gonna be re-watching all pay-per-views I used when I was a kid after I'm done recording this. And I'm just gonna be watching new pay-per-views that I've never saw before. The old ones, like, I'm finally watching the TLC match between John Cena and Edge. See, TakeOver, uh, TakeOver Chicago, the, the two out of three falls match between DIY and the Revival. The turn, some of the great things the tag team match, man. It's hype. I am excited to see this. It should be good. So yeah, guys. <laughs> So yeah, I'm gonna be busy this week when I'm when after I'm doing the corn, but enough me rambling. Let's just jump right into this review. So he starts the episode off. We got we start with Bru with uh, Bruno and the rest of the guys are all just like on the boat over to this going to this island. Just to you know, to go to the next place and to drop off Trish. Uh Fugo asks, you know, hey man, what's on the disc? You know, everything's going well, what's going on? So then Bruce Rocha puts in the disc and we find out what's going on. The, um, the message pops up saying, like, you know, that I thank you guys for giving me my daughter and yada 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 yada. So then we get the list itself of what is actually going to be their list of directives to get in there. First off, they have to meet at this, uh, this island. I can't remember the name. It's Italian and it's long. I, it was like, um, Della something. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm terrible there, but. So they go there. Two... Only two members can, and that they all that there's no way to get inside. There's no stairway with you, and there's only an elevator that's a straight shot up to, 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 up to the bell tower. That's where Trisha's gonna be dropped off. And that only two people can up comp, can only two people can go Trish and one protector. <coughs> that's it. That's the only that's the only one guy. Three, the guy can't have any weapons, knives, guns, phones, and nothing on him. And four, the rest of his companions have to stay on the boat. And not and not go short. If they do, he'll find he'll see it as an act of betrayal. Betrayal, you know. So anyway, after that, we then get so then they so then they land the boat and yo and Misa is out here, man. Like man, we need we are in the city of water, man. That's one thing I did remember. I remember that because it's in English and it's short. <laughs> But we, we need to celebrate, man. We need to eat. There's some good shit here, man. And Laurent is like, oh shit, man, there's some good shit here, man. Man, I didn't know I was hungry until now. What what we got, man? And he's like, we got we got squid pasta. We got I forget it was like squid something pasta. I know he said squid pasta. Um he mentioned this other I forget half these foods, I'm sorry. He mentioned a bunch of other foods that I can't remember the names of. And yo, Laurent is like, oh shit, yo man, this is good, you know. And I'm like, oh, he's and but my man Misa sweeting up this deal, and I'm like, yo man, your mom lending me something. <laughs> and then you get food to not come in like, have you lost it? And can't you forget? We are still on assignment, motherfuckers. <laughs> we are still on the job. Until church is protected, we are still on the job. Stop talking about that food. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then we try to figure out who's going to go into to join or Trish. Obviously, Jorno offers himself because, of course, you know he wants to kill the boss. That's his whole thing. He has a dream. We all know. We all know his backstory and his motives. 
and Butcherantica looks at him. But then Abakio comes in there and be like, whoa, 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 who the fuck you think you are there? Butcherati's the capo, he's going, you arrogant prick. And he's like, he like, yo, if the boss knew who's still alive, he would have picked someone himself. And so Jorno just kind of looks at him, he gets his look live. Man, come on, we doing this? You know? And Butcherati's like, you know what, I gotta do this. Uh, Jorno, I appreciate your offer, but I gotta do this. And so they just kind of look at each other for a moment. I feel like Jorno's giving that look of like, really, fam? Really? Really, fam? <laughs> yeah. And so, the, and so then Jorno, and then Butcherai's like, asks Jorno for one of those lady, ladybug pins or buttons, whatever the hell those things are on his chin. He's like, hey man, you mind offer, this, since this is our final mission, you mind offering some luck. And he goes on with some of the things that um, ladybugs represent. And he's like, yes, they all bring us a good luck. And he hands one of them over to Butcherai. He puts it on him. And, but first, he sees that it's kind of like pulsating. Obviously, I mean, it's still, it's alive, and Jordan will put some shit in it, thanks to Golden Wind. So he puts it on it, and he's able to, and he mentions in narration that, 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 he, get, that he can try and get this on the boss, and if he can, Jordan will contract it. So, they walk inside, him and Trish, they go in there, walk through the thing, and get to the elevator. Once they get to the elevator, and, um, first off, Butcherati, he, like, puts his hand out, so on Trish to stop, he goes, checks it out. The door's wide open, and he's like, okay, ground floor on the roof, straight shot, that's it. Then we see Trish, she's sweating like crazy, and she is straight up shaking. Now, the reason she's doing this is because she's fierce. She's like, oh shit, you know, what's going to happen to me? First, like, get kidnapped by the mafia, now I'm going to a father that I don't even know. And, you know, she's scared. Remember, she's only 15 years old, and she doesn't even know about any of the stand shit. She has a stand, but no one's, gonna t but no one's telling her shit about them. So, you know, she's, she's scared. And Butcherati tries to calm her, being like, don't worry, I can offer some insight. That, that the boss is probably going to have you get a new identity, maybe even give you a new, maybe have you change your appearance a little bit. But he's going to send you off somewhere far away, where no one's going to know who you are, and you'll truly know happiness. That's at least what, which, that's a probably also the reason what we thought was going to happen. Was probably have Trish, send her off, maybe change her appearance a little bit, and send her off on her merry way. Away from all this mafia shit. And she'll truly know happiness, which is what Butcherati said it is. And he says, here, take my hand. He offers his hand over to me, to Trish. Uh, Trish just kind of looks at him and just kind of slaps away and then runs right back. And, then it's like, and the other, she's like, no, I'm not scared. Although you can hear in her voice that she's still a little scared. And, me, and Butcherati just smiles and goes into the elevator. And once he gets inside the elevator is when shit gets crazy, ladies and gentlemen. And so what happens, so eventually there's the elevators going up. Uh, Trisha Vesla does grab, uh, Jor, uh, me, uh, no, uh, uh, Butcherati's hand. Butcherati, of course, grabs it as well, and, you know, they're kind of holding hands there. Watch this be like, oh, ship him, I ship him! Watch it. <laughs> anyway, so, and then, uh, Trisha's like, oh, I wonder if there'll ever be a time where I'll love my father. And she's like, families don't think of stuff like that. And she's like, yeah, you're right. Which I'm assuming I'm sh what he meant by that, because your family, anyway, you'll love each other no matter what. That's at least what I think he meant. I'm not sure. Uh, tell me down below if that's actually what he meant or whatever. So then, we then we then get to the we then see the elevator going up and up and up and up, and then reaches the bell tower. Butcherati's like, all right, sit. We cut to this uh, angle up top where we just see Butcherati. Now at first I'm like, yo, what the hell? Where's Trish? She vanished. Now I'm thinking, oh, probably because he's tower, because Butcherati's taller than her. They probably the way this angle is, they probably have it. She's probably getting covered by him. That was my that was the original my thought, but I found it weird how she suddenly just vanished just like that. Then we see Butcherati turn around, look over, look over his shoulder, and he's like, "What?" And then he sees that Trish is nowhere to be seen, but her hand is still in his hand, bleeding. Yes. Trish got killed! Ish! Maybe! Maybe not! But Trish legit got vanished. She disappeared. We see a giant hole in the... in the roof of the... in the roof of the elevator. He's like, what? How did this happen? The only person people that knew about this was my team and the boss. He doesn't say it, but we can infer that I meant what I was saying. And then, and then I love right here, we have this shot where we have like a bunch of messages and shit from the previous episodes kind of like projecting on the wall and kind of like, it looked like a really, it was a really nice shot. Really did the shot, he's like, wait, were we only here just so the boss could kill her with his own hands? And also, I gotta get mad, because well, he was just like, what the hell? 
<laughs> and like blood just starts spewing out of her hand. I gotta give major props to Jordan, not Jordan, to Buturati's dub voice. The man absolutely killed this scene, man. So props, huge props go to him, man. Is this he, he did this scene. He was amazing this scene. So then we cut to commercial. All the reason I bring it up, cut the commercial, because he's like, oh shit, what's gonna happen next? We cut the commercial, then we get back from commercial. We actually then finally get Bucciarati's backstory, which was actually really interesting. I really dug his backstory, man. I like the backstory for all these characters. So we, so we find out that Bruno lived on an island outside of Napoli, and he was a father, and he was the son of a fisherman. You know, his daddy would do some fishing, do that shit, that would be his job, and he would be known to be a bit standoffish, but he was always a man of integrity. So, you know, we learn about his mom, his mom would cook, she always loved him, they always, she always, he always loved her, so I mean, yeah, she loved him, obviously, but she always loved him, her, and you know, it would warm his soul whenever they would talk, and he loved her telling him bedtime stories. Then, they got divorced. Uh, Bruno overheard the conversation about what, they, about them, saying like, we gotta, we gotta separate, I can't do this no more, I have to find my way. This is the way. <laughs> Where's the Mandalorian being like, this is the way. <laughs> But anyway, afterwards, they end up asking they let the decision of who takes the kid as Bruce. Does he want to live with his mom or stay with his dad? Now, you know, Bruno's mom, she's like, oh, hey, Bruno, you know, we gotta go. We're gonna separate. We love you more, but we're gonna leave it to your choice. And and she's like, but you want, you want to stay with me, right? You know, and she starts to sweeten the deal a little bit. Be like, oh, you know, it's gonna be fun. There'll be kids your age. You'll be always be a bright kid. You'll get to go to school. You know, she's sweetening the deal to just abandon his father. But Bruno kind of had it in his mind that his mom would be fine even without him. His dad, not so much. So Bruno exercises he's gonna live with his dad, and everyone is shocked by this, especially his mom. Dad's like, wait, what? <laughs> like, I think, I feel like even he thought that Bruno would have went with his mom, but uh, Bruno. <laughs> and then once Bruno says he's gonna go stay with dad, her mom, his mom is just like, oh, come on, Bruno, don't make such a rash decision. Come on now. And she's like, I'm staying with Papa. And then she just starts sobbing into his shoulder. And, you know, she ends up leaving, and she says that she'll come back and visit every month. And eventually, I think he said like two years later, she ended up finding someone else and would only go for Christmas. So yeah, she wouldn't even come for the man's birthday. The fuck? What kind of mother are you? <laughs> so anyway, uh, Bruno's dad did some other stuff on the side to get Bruno into a good school. And that led to these two guys being like, hey man, we want fish in that island. And Bruno's dad's like, uh, fam, that island ain't that great for fishing. He's like, I don't give a shit. I want to fish in that island. Do your job, fisherman or fish boy or whatever the hell they call them. Boatman or whatever the hell he called, I forget exactly, but he's like, yo, do your job. And he's like, alright. They go there, next thing we find out, dude gets is gets pumped full of lead, seven bullet wounds, and has to go into and it goes into surgery. So after they get into surgery and Bruno is like, oh, that cop tells him that he might they win as a drug deal, it was for cocaine. And that uh, he's like, and that guy in Gabriel this hatred for cocaine, man. It's like, oh the damn those that those drugs got my pop on there. And you know, he managed to get out of there, nothing hit them internal organs, all was good. Those two later come back in there to finish the job, but they were released on something because Bruno came out under the bed and stabbed these motherfuckers. And one guy, he just like stabbed in the chest and then like kind of like carved the knife upward, going, I think he even like cut his neck. The other guy, he just stabs him right in the eye. Brutal shit, my dude, brutal. So then after that, Giorno, or not, yeah, Bru not that Bruno kind of just decides to you know, I need to find a way to protect my dad, and I can't run the cops, so he ends up joining the mafia, and that's where he gets there. But he eventually finds out that actually that, that the boss is profiting off of cocaine, so we could probably say Bruno probably ain't a big fan of Cubans if y'all catch my truth. I swear to God, anyone that doesn't get that reference is probably gonna think I'm fucking racist when I'm not. Learn some fucking cinema, you learn some cinema, putados. <laughs> anyway. So, he finds out the cocaine is like being profited on here, and that ends up, that also drove him to get rid of the boss. So then he goes on this ramp, be like, your cowardice disgusts me, it makes me want to puke. Once again, Jorno's dub voice absolutely kills the scene, uses Zipperman to open an um, opening on the bottom of the elevator, sees him sliding down the thing, and then... He goes out there, he drops the ladybug, and he actually lands right on his ass, which I found kind of funny. And he walks out, so Bruno uh, gives chase. And he says he'll die by assassination as he's sliding down the elevator shaft down to the bottom where uh, the elevator door was that the uh, boss escaped from. 
which we'll talk about the boss in a minute. I gotta say that I love his dub voice, and I'll also tell you guys a little bit more about because I actually found out who, because I checked the Chris Ewing voice, and I'm glad I found a guy fighting him voice. So, but we'll get to that in a second. So he gets down there. He's like, okay, I'm gonna take care of him and kill him. Looks around, finds a little blood on by this uh, shelf or whatever. He opens it up, and which leads downstairs to like a staircase to a church, the crypt of a church. So he goes down there. And of course, he would go there to, you know, kill church. Kill Trish on her or on no, uh, anonym, uh, not, uh, anonymously or whatever. He goes down there, follows it, and he ends up kind of standing by this pillar that's right by where the staircase ends or begins, whichever way where you would come out from the staircase. So he's sitting there waiting for the boss, and you see the boss holding Trish. And I'm sure every, all of us were on the edge of our seats, be like, Are we gonna see the boss? Are we gonna see what the dude finally looks like? How much does he look like Trish? Does he look like Trish at all? Does he have pink hair? We all, these are all the questions that I'm sure were all in our minds. And then, as he gets right, I'm right below where you can finally see his face, he says, Turn back, Bucciarati. If you turn back now, you will survive. You still can. Turn away from that pillar and you will die. I'm like, bruh, how the hell did you see him? And I'm like, damn. This man just just set out a declaration of war, and I guess I already love about. Now I don't think he's as cool as Kira, but man is he close! Man is he close to Kira levels of badass coolness, you know? So Butrai doesn't obviously doesn't listen to him. He says, "Superman, find him!" He comes at him, but uh, we see two arms kind of grab his arm or his or Zipperman's arms, and it twists, it, breaking his arm. He's like, "Ah, oh, break it!" He breaks his arm off to try to get him, but he still misses. And he comes down there, or he takes out the pillar he's currently on. Pieces of it fall to the ground. He jumps down to the ground, runs over to where Trish is, and reattaches her hand. And he kind of just stands there, being like, "I know who you are. I know what you, what your, what I'll tell." And once Trish regains consciousness, I'll tell her that you never existed at all. And he's just like, "Trish, why bring her into this?" Now, now let, me, let me go through the rest of the episode, then I'll talk about his dub voice. So, afterwards, he kind of looking around for him, and he opens up like his face over the zipper, and it and it reveals a phone. Yeah, on the phone. Jorno's on the other line, and he tells him, yeah, we're already on a Buterati, and that he is in the, that he is inside the pillar two, I forget what it says, like, it was like two meters ahead of him, but he says, but he tells him to wait, like, don't do it now. Buterati doesn't listen, just like, super has him go through the whole order, order thing, you know, go into the pillar, and you see it opening, and you see his figure. And we're like, and he goes after him, but then his body disappears, and shows off Buterati's body. So, and then we kind of see, kind of like, have, kind of like, have like this ghostly, like, smoke kind of coming from it. But then we see his, the other body next to him, or where he was when he was punching, start to vanish. And he's like, what the hell is going on? And then we see a stand. King Crimson, or I believe the dub calls it Emperor Crimson. By the way, I like the dub. I like the name change. If you're going to King Crimson, Emperor Crimson, I think I might have just stick to Emperor Crimson, honestly. But anyway. He punches him right in the midsection, and he tells him that, you know, that what you experienced was the work of the heart. And that because this is your end, I will let you know that you saw your future self, you know, demolish and everything. And now, fall, and now enjoy the gates of hell. <laughs> and he like, and he's like, has this legit, legit fully through Buterati, and like, there's blood spewing out of him. And that's where the episode ends. Really crazy shit. Now. Let me talk about his dub voice right quick. First off, Adventure 4, I love it. But I found a hilarious who voiced him. He's voiced by Kellen Jim, which you guys know, if you guys are fans of Hirawaka, or you watch my Hirawaka movies, you know that was also the voice for over. And I gotta give the man mad points with his vault, cause he complete, I did you, if I didn't look at the credits, the last person on my mind would be him. He sounds nothing like he uses. This man, like, deepened his voice, like, really deep. Like, I'm like, damn. Uh, so I gotta give major price to Kellen, man. I love his dub voice for um, Emperor Crimson, King Crimson, the boss, whatever. Love it. So yeah, man. Overall. Now, do I think this is the end of Buterati? I mean, we're like, what, 20-some-odd episodes in? Maybe 10-something in? I feel like it's a little too early for Buterati to die, seeming how he's been a main stay of the series. I mean, character. So I don't. Th I think somehow, some way, Jorno or himself, someone is gonna find a way for him to survive. Now, now he could technically die, and Araki could do the fake out again, like he did with um, uh, 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 Abdal. 
and start and start Crusade, then kill him off for real neck later on around the end game. He could do that and have the boss kill him twice. So we could go with so he could go that route, or he could just die now, or he finds some way to survive. But I doubt that because I mean, did y'all see him? He wasn't looking so hot. So yeah, overall, I give this episode a ten out of ten. This episode was fucking fire. Love this episode. Yeah. Hope y'all enjoyed the video. Leave a like if you did. Subscribe if you're new. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, if you like, links in the description box below. And as always, come back for more. See you guys next time. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to relive my childhood. <laughs> <laughs>